Today's company is one that has previously been covered tangentially. Imagine Software were a bit part player in the story of Ocean Software. As David Ward's boys ascended to power, Imagine were coming to their own spectacular end. The fate of the name was to be used as a label by Ocean, pushing out the likes of Green Beret and Hyper Sports. Classic games would be released by Imagine for years to come, but they were not the same. Imagine's story before that is one of glorious success and recognition across the UK. And hell, their fate is more than just being brought up by Ocean. There's a lot more to look at, and so Imagine definitely need their own video. Like Ultimate, they only truly lasted a couple of years, but the fate that befell them was so much harsher. Still, something else did come out of them at the end, and this video serves as a prologue to that. Before that though, we look at UK Gaming's original rock and rollers, Imagine. One thing to note about the UK coder boom is that quite a lot of the major software companies that existed then operated well out of London. Indeed, a fair few of them were from the North, which was, in dark times such as the early 80s when Thatcherism loomed large and industry was being hit hard, a small victory. Imagine's origins lay in the Liverpool-based Bug Bite, a name that's largely famous because they originally published Matthew Smith's humongously successful Manic Miner. In 1982, a bunch of their employees decided to break out of Bug Bite and go it alone, in particular Mark Butler, Eugene Evans and David Lawson. Sticking in Liverpool, they chose a company name that just so happens to be the same as the most famous song written by the city's most famous son. Butler and Lawson were very tightly connected, and while Imagine employed so many people, including quite a few of the best coders of the era, these two were always at the front, and they would soon be joined by a third man. Before Bug Bite, Butler and Lawson worked in a shop called Micro Digital in the heart of the city centre. This shop is often credited as being one of, if not the very first, dedicated computer shop in the whole of the country. When they formed Imagine, they invited the shop's former owner, Bruce Everis, along for the ride. Frustrated after selling up Micro Digital, he gladly accepted. Everis would take control of the PR side and day-to-day -day operation of the company, Butler took charge of business as a director, and Evans and Lawson concentrated on programming with Lawson heading that up. There would then be a fourth key member hired at Lawson's behest, Ian Heverington, who would deal with the company's finances. The PR side is very important when it comes to Imagine, as this company is the exact inverse of Ultimate. Whereas Ultimate gave no interviews, Imagine were press darlings who wanted as many words in print about them as possible. In the company's heyday, it wasn't uncommon for someone like Eugene Evans to be featured in an article or two along the lines of, I was coding in my bedroom, and now I earn 35 grand a year. But, good PR or not, you need a game to sell. Fortunately, David Lawson had one in his pocket, one that he'd made but wasn't particularly convinced that Bug Bite would do a good job of selling, and so he thought that he should do it himself. And he certainly made the right decision. Arcadia, the resulting debut, wasn't a looker or anything, but it certainly showed a lot of intent. It was a pretty decent and thoroughly hard arcade-style shooter, really quite good for a mere 16 kilobytes, and it reviewed very well in the early mags of the day. It might not look a whole lot, but... Geez, this is one of the earliest games I've ever looked at, coming out as early as 1982, right in the infancy of the spectrum as a home computer, when games were only just becoming a thing. And so, Arcadia helped to show the way and lay the foundation for many other games going forward. And of course, because there wasn't a whole lot of games out at that time, it managed to sell a hell of a lot of copies and it helped to set up the new company financially, almost single-handedly. It would set up a whirlwind of a year. Imagine were immediately buoyed by this success, allowing them to hire a whole host of programmers, all of which would go forth and work on really strong games that would try and stretch the specy as much as it could in these years, and at just the right time. 1983 was when the specy would really catch fire, mainly thanks to the loads of games. Even if Sir Clive might not have necessarily cared for that, his bank balance probably didn't mind all that much. 
Imagine would release plenty of well received and quite popular games throughout 1983 as the bedroom coda boom reached its peak. Newspapers were now filling up with stories and pictures of these awkward looking young people, a lot of them teenagers, who'd made a game in their home and had sold it to a software publisher, later making bags of money in royalties. And Imagine typified that newfound success in many ways, good and bad. But I don't want to go straight into the rock and roll stories and political machinations that followed it. Let's actually look at some of the games first, otherwise they will suffer if we try and cover them at the same time as everything else. We'll start with a couple of the best received ones and quickly hit the rest from there. Most of Imagine's games were only published for the ZX Spectrum, so all that you see here is Spectrum unless noted. First up, R. Didums, David Lawson's first game after Arcadia. You have to sort out all the building blocks in order to advance from one toy box to the next, and you play as this big giant teddy bear. A cute concept that worked very well in its time, Crash actually awarded this their Game of the Year in 1983. I have to be honest and say that I don't really get it, it's not a favourite of mine. One of the big troubles with it is a familiar specky problem. You have to sort these blocks by colour, but as soon as you put one up there you get a shitload of colour clash, and that can be really confusing if I'm honest. Alchemist is a game by Ian Weatherburn and is undoubtedly one of Imagine's most groundbreaking games. This was one of the first collect em up platformers on the Specky, and it would influence a whole ton of games, from Dizzy to Dynamite Dan, perhaps even Jet Set Willy. You play as a wizard who can morph into a bird at will, you can cast spells and you have to solve puzzles through collecting items to get through the game. You have to be careful about managing your spell energy low, while making sure you watch your stamina. Despite its age, it's not held up too terribly, seeing as it's quite like a lot of other specky games, and the graphics were pretty damn alright for 1983 at least. This and Arcadia are probably my favourite Imagine games as it goes. Zoom is an okay little game, designed by bearded wildman John Gibson. It's actually a very early sort of flight simulator where you try to save refugees by blasting down as many planes as you can before they either bomb the shit out of them or take you out of the sky. It might be primitive even when compared to something like F-16 Fighting Falcon, but it's quite straightforward and entertaining as far as little shooters go. Ok, let's be more rapid fire about this. Stonkers, also by John Gibson, is a very early attempt at a real time strategy game. I struggle with this genre in general, so I have to be honest and say that I have no idea what I'm doing here, but while reports said it was quite buggy, it did win an award for best war game from Crash. Jumping Jack from 1983 is a game where you have to jump from level to level through scrolling gaps while avoiding the ones below you. Uh, it's really not good and it also seems to crash quite a lot. Ian Weatherburn's Zip Zap is an intense arcade game where you collect bits of a teleporter. It has a touch of the Robotrons about it. The game's not bad if you can get used to the rather odd controls, but having to turn your robot can be quite annoying and imprecise. It's kind of like, I don't know, Forgotten Worlds or something along those lines, in terms of controls. Gibson's Molar Mall is, well, it's a game where you clean somebody's teeth. It's kind of odd, but as far as teeth cleaning simulators go, I would definitely take it over Rex Ronan Experimental Surgeon. There are a couple of games from 1984, of course. BC Bill is a game where you, a caveman, get to women by bonking them on the head with your club while trying to get food as well. And Cosmic Cruiser is a game where you try and infiltrate an alien ship in order to rescue hostages from being probed. They both stink, although there's probably good reason for that. And lastly is an odd one called Wizardor. It's dated as either 1984 or 1985, which makes me think that it's either one of the last games Imagine published before the Calamity, or one of the first that Ocean published under the Imagine label, and it's for the BBC Micro, where it sold quite well. Looks kind of ho-hum now, but a bit of trivia. This is the first successful game to be designed by a then 16 year old Chris Roberts. Yes, the same Chris Roberts of Win Commander and Star Citizen fame. And so that's Imagine's Games. 
By and large, I'd say that the games of Gibson and Weatherburn are certainly the strongest of theirs. They were both very consistent and they had some interesting ideas, and also Lawson certainly made a couple of hits himself. Other than that, it can get somewhat middling and quite buggy to boot. On the whole though, it's not a bad showing for around about 18 months. Tis a shame then that that is virtually all the time Imagine would have. But of course we'll be getting to that right about now. While Imagine certainly scored high with plenty of hits in 1983, it does have to be said that the quality of the games did go down as the year went on. Not that they were necessarily terrible, but they did occasionally ship with some serious buggage. A curious thing to be honest, perhaps they were trying to swarm the market too fast. 1983 was a cutthroat year and it was all about trying to be top as the market for games soared to such a high point. You've got to do what you can. And of course, as hard as you're working, if you're Imagine, you've got to play twice as hard. As soon as Imagine got some smashers in their pocket, they felt as though the sky was the limit. It didn't take long for them to get state-of-the-art officers and tons of computer terminals, complete with a crack team of programmers to use them. At one point, 103 people were working for Imagine, which is a pretty damn big number for an early 80s software company. But that wasn't nearly the end of it. There were the cars. Lots of them. It's said that at one point, just about anyone who had a decent job at Imagine had a sports car. More than one person had a Ferrari, and most others had BMWs. Mark Butler had his pride and joy, a custom-built Harris motorbike. Even the cleaners drove handsomely at Imagine. It is said that at one point, there were plans to get a helipad installed on top of the office. There were plans to expand immediately, with a proposed offshoot called Studio Stin that would essentially act as Imagine's ad agency and would be co-won by Stephen Blower, who designed most of Imagine's artwork. And of course, there was the racing team. Yeah, the racing team. Primarily set up so that Mark Butler could relax into his hobby of racing fast motorbikes. Imagine were moving at breakneck speed, and they were more than happy to court the press and be the faces of the British software boom. Something to aspire to, the face of just what you could be if you had a decent game and the ability to sell it. You might ask if they really had all the money they needed to set all of these things up. And, um, well, yes, uh, <laughs> that's a very good question. A very good question indeed. As a rule, Imagine were rather bad with money. Over the course of their short existence, they moved offices not once, but twice, both times before the lease on their previous space had finished. The scores of programmers they hired were given total creative freedom by Lawson, who demanded that they were left undisturbed to work their magic. This sounds amazing in theory, but it also meant that a fair few people were basically sitting around doing nothing and getting paid for it. And it won't surprise you to learn that at no point did Imagine ever hire a fully-fledged bona fide accountant. Even in this, what should have been a glorious year for Imagine, cracks were forming. In particular, a split between the guys at the head of the company, Lawson and Heverington on one side, Butler and Everest on the other. There was a little bit of a personality clash, and as the year wore on, things would become ever more fractious. And all the while, the money continued to be spent, and usually quite lavishly. Something had to give, and the give ultimately came in the form of two games that weren't, two of the most hyped games ever, never to come out. Imagine's fate as a whole is often blamed entirely on their two supposed mega games, Cyclops and Bandersnatch, and while the truth is that things were going badly one before that, the mega games certainly didn't help. These mega games, the first two of a proposed six, were apparently going to completely redefine the spectrum and what it was capable of. And Imagine could certainly hype them up no end. Publishers Marshall Cavendish made a deal for the games that was apparently worth £11 million, an almost impossibly gargantuan amount of money for two pieces of software when the deal was signed in late 1983. It was perhaps a sign that computer games were here to stay, and that fins were going to be this good forever. And naturally it was a cue to spend a load more money. 
We know a fair bit more about Bandersnatch than we do about the other one, mainly because it did eventually in one form or another arrive, but we won't get to that until later. It was an action adventure game with speech and top level graphics and all sorts. In order to extend the Spectrum's capabilities enough for it to play Bandersnatch, the game would actually have to ship with a cartridge or dongle of sorts in order for it to be played, which drove the potential cost of the game up significantly. As in, Bandersnatch was expected to be sold at a retail price of £40, at a time when the going weight for games was usually between £5 and £7. £10 was considered majorly expensive, but £40? Good lord that's a hard sell. Very little on the other hand is known about Cyclops, we don't know how much that game was going to sell for or frankly what it was even supposed to be. In fact at the time that development stopped on the game it's likely that no coding had been done on the game at all. It only ever existed, for the most part, on paper. But that certainly didn't stop Imagine hyping up both it and Bandersnatch. Adverts appeared in the game in press with the Imagine coding team staring in shock, unprepared for just what was to come. Sometimes there is truth in advertising, you know. Oh, and Imagine also commissioned no lesser figure than Roger Dean, he of the cover art for many an album by Yes, ELP and the like, to do the artwork and adverts for the games. Dean demanded £6,000 up front for this, which he duly received. Roger Dean was one of the lucky ones. It is likely that as soon as the Mega Games started rolling, chaos truly started to reign at Imagine. Lawson was now knee deep into these Mega Games, utterly committed to making them work and doing something which he hadn't wanted to do previously, interfere with the programming team to get them exclusively working on Bandersnatch in particular, trying to make this game work. Cause hell, even though adverts were coming out for them, the games were a long way from complete and there were still loads of problems with just even getting it to slightly work on the specy. Mark Butler? Well, not to be too funny, but he seemed to mostly be committed to the racing team. Imagine's two figureheads, as a result, were not as visible to the press as they had been previously. Indeed, it often seemed to most people that Bruce Everest was actually in charge of the company as a whole, which he wasn't. But then he was the one who was actually trying to keep the office together. And while he is certainly quite an outspoken person, and a person you can certainly have an opinion on, he can't really be blamed for the chaos at Imagine too much. There were plenty of other calamities. Imagine expected Christmas 1983 to be the moment when the software boom hit full tilt, and they wanted to take advantage of that in a big way. They acted very aggressively indeed. In fact, they booked out the entire duplicating capacity of the Kitdale factory for the Christmas period. Kitdale was, at the time, one of the biggest software duplicators in the country, and theoretically booking it out completely could mean that other software companies would have a shortage of their games on the shelves at Christmas, whereas imagine well, they'd have all the games. The plan failed for one primary reason. Imagine made way, way, way too many frickin' tapes. Hundreds and thousands of them. This seemed fine for Christmas, and indeed it was, but the demand wasn't going to be the same after Christmas. Indeed, as soon as 1984 started, the software boom eased off considerably. While there was never anything close to a crash, the demand did drop by quite a lot, and 1984 was a year of struggle for many. While we may have already covered the likes of Ocean and Ultimate who actually prospered in this year, the pack as a whole gradually started to thin out. The result was that Imagine were left with tons of tapes on the shelves that weren't selling and would have to be shifted for considerably less than their wholesale price. Needless to say, this pissed off a lot of people. Not to mention that Imagine, once again, spent way more money than they needed to. The easing off of the software boom naturally also affected those mega games. Suddenly the idea of charging £30 for a game wasn't just risky, it was absolute raving bloody madness. Equally, Marshall Cavendish were not all that satisfied at the progress made on either Bandersnatch or Cyclops, and so they pulled out of that £11 million deal, meaning of course that they wanted the money they'd already injected into the project back, and god knows who else wanted their money back too. 
The sensible thing to do, if anything could have helped, would have been to downsize dramatically. But no, even in 1984, chaos continued to wane. The overheads were way higher than anyone could manage, but what was done about that? <laughs> Not much. The company still employed around 100 people, unwilling to let anyone go. There were attempts to sell Bandersnatch, or even Imagine as a whole, but nothing truly came off aside from one deal that sounds like a white doozy. A plan to sell Bandersnatch to Sinclair Research, who would then sell the game for the Sinclair QL on a frickin' microdrive. I mean, good lord. Just look at that holy trinity of failure right there. It's beautiful, isn't it? But while the deal was agreed, in the end there wasn't enough time. And of course, a lot of this chaos was being captured on film. A director named Paul Anderson had been filming Imagine since late 1983, as well as filming Ocean for a BBC documentary called Commercial Breaks. He'd originally come in thinking that he'd be filming these young hotheads in their pomp, watching as they prepared for the Christmas rush, sold loads of games and made bags of money. Little did he know that he and his team would bear witness to the fall of a company. I've said it before and I'll say it again, if you want an absolutely essential document of the British software industry in the early 80s, as it happened, then you need to watch Commercial Breaks. It's 30 minutes of greatness. As we headed into the summer of 1984, the situation at Imagine was anarchy. And of course it was here that the fractious nature of Imagine's masthead would truly take form. David Lawson and Ian Heverington knew, in their heart of hearts, that the game was well and truly up. In the last weeks of the company, they virtually disappeared and set up a new company called Finch Speed. They wouldn't last long, but the primary goal of the company was to acquire as much of Imagine's assets as they could when the hammer inevitably fell, and perhaps even, maybe, just maybe, to get enough shit together to finish and sell Bandersnatch. It was all… kind of shady, especially seeing as Mark Butler and Bruce Everest knew virtually next to nothing about it. Everest, for his part, was faced with an office that was basically unwinnable, where the main attraction was underworked programmers duelling with fire extinguishers. And Butler? Well, his head seemed to be somewhat buried in the sand. There's a great scene in commercial breaks where one man stands for what seems like ages and hell probably was, pacing around Imagine's reception, waiting to speak to someone, anyone, about money that he is owed. He represented the Kitdale duplication plant. And he wasn't the only one. In fact, Imagine's creditors at this point could have probably filled up Anfield. The end would soon come. On the 9th of June, one of Imagine's many creditors, the VNU Press, petitioned the High Courts to wind the company up. There was no opposition. In another scene memorably captured in commercial breaks, the bailiffs arrived just as the staff were coming back from lunch. They took everything they could, and even Anderson's camera crew nearly had their kit inventoried. Of the big three at the company's head, only Mark Butler eventually showed. Amazingly enough, he'd been racing and had to be driven back because he'd had a crash. Lawson and Heverington, well, they were nowhere to be found. In the days following on from this, Everest resigned from his role, and eventually Butler announced what was plainly obvious to his staff. Imagine were officially dead. There was a lot of acrimony in the fallout, some of which was covered in the game in press by magazines like Crash, who were actually amongst Imagine's many creditors. Mark Butler was eventually let in on a third of Finch Speed, but in truth, no one really knows just what Lawson and Heverington were quite up to when they disappeared for a bit, including a trip to America. Some have wondered whether they were on a last minute trip for funding Imagine, but that would have been too little and too late to save the company. Either that or they were looking for funding for their own fin. Anywho, the aftermath was largely as follows. Most of Imagine's IPs wound up owned by Bill Jolly, and the name of Imagine itself was, of course, sold to Ocean Software. A neat little twist of history meaning that the name survived, and Ocean continued to employ people who'd made their bones at the original Imagine. Imagine survived as one of Ocean's labels, and plenty of good games were released under it until Ocean gradually phased it out around 1990. The Ocean Software documentary obviously goes a bit more in depth on this stuff. 
With regards to the original Imagine, I don't want to be too damning about the company, or even the people who are in charge of it, even though I bloody well could be because it's just ridiculous. They were, in many ways, very young and very foolish. When the whiff of big money came around, they started splashing it like there was no tomorrow. I'm sure that someone like Mark Butler comes off like a whopping great fool in this video, and he would later admit as such, appearing several times to tell his story of how he became an ex-millionaire. But, well, it's not like absolutely none of us would end up doing the same thing in his position. When things happen so fast, it's so easy for it all to just go straight to your head. Get a group of young folks together, suddenly turn them into millionaires and hey, the party's never going to end, right? Let's live out everything. Until, of course, the police come in and smash your record player up. In 1983, people did think that the software party was going to last forever, that it would hoist ailing British industry as a whole up on its shoulders, and that it was the future of things. It was in 1984 when we saw that it was not quite that sort of saviour. We saw just how ruthless Finns could be, and only the strong and smart companies survived and thrived in a creative but dangerous time. In the end, the original Imagine were not one of them. As for Imagine staff, well, they all moved on to other Finns. The likes of Bruce Everest and Eugene Evans would go on to have long and successful careers in the industry. To this day, Everest continues to blame the advent of home piracy for the downfall of Imagine. Mark Butler, post Imagine, struggled to find consistent work, particularly as the gaming press decided that he should be the man to blame for Imagine's demise, but he did soon find his industry feet again. The programmers, artists, and what have you moved on to various projects. Some, like Stephen Blower, would join Ocean, either working with the Imagine label or not. A small group of Imagine's best, including Gibson and Weatherburn, formed Denton Designs, makers of the likes of Frankie Goes to Hollywood and The Great Escape. However, by 1986, only one of this original group, Ali Noble, remained at the company. Ian Weatherburn moved on to Ocean in 1985 before tragically committing suicide in 1989. John Gibson, after a couple of years in freelance, would soon find himself once again part of a company won by the two people we've not mentioned so far, David Lawson and Ian Hetherington. As for the original Imagine's IPs, well, well, most of them faded away into budget compilation world under the guide of Beau Jolly, with the exception of one, Bandersnatch. We did eventually see the game, Roger Dean artwork and all, Thankfully it never came out for the Sinclair QL, any thought of that soon faded away what with the death of that computer, and indeed the sale of the Speccy to Amstrad. And of course any prospective deal where Sinclair bought Imagine, that was talked about at one point, never materialised. Bandersnatch instead saw the light of day in 1986, coming out for the Amiga amongst others, under the new name of Bratakus. The end result is a somewhat janky but memorable looking side-scrolling action adventure with a big sci-fi bent, and a game that did an okay job of showing the Amiga's graphical capabilities, whereas the Spectrum would have surely never handled this game, for the Amiga it was no sweat. It's okay really, ho hum. What's really interesting is that it was largely coded by David Lawson, as a part of his brand new company, one that also formed in Liverpool, and one that he formed with Ian Hetherington. Watarkus is the first game to be released by that company with the fancy Yowlish logo, which believe it or not was also designed by Roger Dean. This is the first game by Cygnosis. Many thanks as usual for watching this video on the story of Imagine Software. If you liked the video then do consider liking it, do consider subscribing, and you can of course follow me on my social media, my Facebook, my Twitter, and you can support me on Patreon. Now as far as supporters go, well, there are songs to be sung. Songs like Jason Leach, Martin Pataki, Taylor Armand, Mark Johnston, Twisted Squad, Grant Butler, Vishadi, Ian Roberts, Dragon Sex Master, Joel Hartman, 
Bill Tabrook, Ben Coker, Jamie Hampshire, Tiago Pereira dos Santos Silva dos Santos Silva, Lee Norris, Gray from Blackpool, Dave Parkinson, Olaf Albin. Yeah. I also have Lee's people to thank um, Tim Lintz, Robert Kelly, Jamie Davenport, Johan Eriksson, Stephen Hornsby, Jan Best, Robin Banks, Dan Roscoe, Terry Anderson, Francisco Pimenta, Kev Gilmore, Alexander Green, Thomas Daniels, Greg Olson, Christian Earnshaw, Stuart Ashen, Lee Harris, James Itt, Mike Siegler, Edge Reader, Russell Hugo, Ken Barraclough, Mark Johnson, Gerard Morris, Matt Lee, Paolo Leary, Graham Kamak, Scott Mitten, Nicole Ketchum, Mark Brooks, Ninth Demon, Peter Sidon, Ludwig Holmstrom, John Izell, Kit Leary, L. O'Brien, and Novel. Thank you all so much for your superb support. I do love you all. Now, Cygnosis isn't going to be the next video. I'm going to call and do some nice reviewing for a little bit, but Cygnosis will be coming soon, as you may well have gathered from that ending. So, I shall see you for the next video, but until then I tide you over with wherever you are, and whoever you be, have a good one, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye!